first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello everyone, this is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you very much for joining us. We're live streaming here at the Fox 12 Oregon Newsroom, something we do every weekday starting at 1 o'clock going throughout the afternoon, covering a wide range of topics. Today we're talking about something that I feel like everybody in the Pacific Northwest and really the West Coast in general has probably considered and discussed uh, certainly many times, and that is earthquakes. We live in a very, very heavy earthquake zone where we have a lot of fault lines, but in particular, there's two big ones, the Cascadia subduction zone and also that San Andreas fault down in California. Those are two very big fault lines, but are they connected? There's a new study that says they might be. So we're going to be discussing that and the ramifications of that and how that all works. Joining us right now, we have Chris Goldfinger from Oregon State University. And thank you very much for being here with us today to talk about this. You know, it's um, uh, something I think that's fascinating to think about. And uh, I was hoping maybe we could start off, if you don't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and, you know, your role there at Oregon State and how this study came to be. Oh, hi, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm, a, I'm a marine geologist. I, I work on uh, offshore fault systems and, uh, and an earthquake geologist as well. So, and, and narrowing that down even a little more, I'm a paleo seismologist, so I work on past earthquakes. Wow, so studying all those past earthquakes that, you know, have occurred, and that's, that's a fascinating, we could probably do a whole interview just on that field. Um, but, but talking about this study, so what is it, I guess, can you walk us through, you know, the, you know, the findings of this study and what it is that you, you set out to look at when you were doing this? Yeah, sure. Um, we, uh, we were working in, on the Cascadia subduction zone and been working on that for many years. And, and one of the, in the early days, we, we sort of made a navigational mistake and wound up a little too far south. Uh, off the of San Andreas, and we we took a core there since we were there, and we thought maybe someday we would come back to it and and work on that, and uh, and we did. And so over the years, we worked through the 2000s. We worked on both uh, the records for both faults uh, separately, and then some uh, somewhere along the line, we started to realize that the ages of the earthquakes on the Cascadia side looked a lot like uh, the ages of the earthquakes on the San Andreas side, and that was a bit of a head scratcher since that shouldn't be the case. And so we worked on that some more and eventually decided that maybe the two faults were linked. And we wrote a, a paper in 2008 suggesting that based on uh, the radiocarbon coincidence. Um, but radiocarbon error, uh, radio, radiocarbon ages that we use have a lot of uncertainties, right? So um, you can have something that looks like it matches up but may have an uncertainty of 100 to 150 years. And so... You know, it was a nice hypothesis and a nice coincidence, but not a smoking gun by, by any means. So we went back with some more cruises and more data and more, more mostly head scratching to try to think about a few things. And one of the things that, that sort of drove us crazy all this time was that some of the, some of the deposits that we look at, and these things are called turbidites, they're just submarine landslides that come rumbling down the hill uh, after an earthquake. Um, some of them seem to be upside down. They have the sand at the top of the deposit instead of at the bottom where you'd expect, and gravity works the same everywhere, so the sand normally goes to the bottom. And so um, it took us something like 20 years to, to um, come up with an idea about how that could be. It just was not making sense, not making sense. And finally, we re started to realize that um, the reason that the ages of these events looked similar and the reason that these uh, uh, deposits looked to be upside down was the same reason, is that we were, we were observing two earthquakes, one stacked on top of the other very closely in time. And so in the, on the San Andreas side, the Cascadia earthquake was represented by a weak deposit because it was more distant. And on top of that was a sandy deposit. Uh, which is very robust because the San Andreas Fault is very close by. And so that explained both things, that we were actually dating um, both earthquakes and seeing the result of two earthquakes uh, that occurred very close in time and created a stacked sort of double-decker uh, deposit with San Andreas on top. And so we see that pattern going back at least 3,000 years, uh, possibly as much as 10,000, but the, the evidence gets weaker and, and less uh, robust with time. So we're, this paper is just about the last 3,000 years and the last uh, six to eight Cascadia earthquakes, all of which seem to have a San Andreas uh, 
pairing with them. Wow. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last Cascadia earthquake was in the 1700s. Is that right? Right. It was actually uh, January 26, 1700. And we know that from the arrival of a tsunami in Japan, which nailed it down to uh, not only the day, uh, but the even time of day. So about 9 p.m. That, which is a, crazy just to be able to have that kind of accuracy, um, which is amazing. Um, so, yeah. so you're able yeah. to pair, yeah, right? I mean, but, but able to pair that to activity there in the San Andreas. So, I mean, so essentially, you know, what are the ramifications of understanding this? Would this mean that an earthquake on the San Andreas fault line could trigger something on the Cascadia subduction zone? Well, um, all the evidence that we see suggests that it goes the other way. Uh, that Cascadia goes first and San Andreas goes second. And the reason we think that is that double-decker turbidite on the San Andreas side always has the, 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 the nearby earthquake, the San Andreas earthquake, on top with a big heavy sand deposit. We can't really tell that for, with absolute certainty, but it's, it's, that model fits all the data really well, and having it go the other way contradicts a lot of the, a lot of the data. So it looks like... Um, uh, the vast majority of the cases, uh, perhaps all of them, uh, go the other way from from uh, north to south. Gotcha. So that big Cascadia, the the big one, uh, when that does happen. So this is something that could trigger something in San Andreas. I mean, what does you know scientifically? This seems like a a pretty big revelation. You know, of, of being able to match all of this data up. Um, you know, what does this mean from from your standpoint, from a geology standpoint? Well, it. Um, as as a geologist, we we get excited about this kind of stuff, even though even though it may have doom and gloom sort of ramifications. The geology itself is is pretty remarkable, and the picture you're showing now shows the 1906 earthquake on the left compared to one of these upside down doublets uh, on the right, and you can see how different they are. So the 1906 earthquake all by itself is a relatively modest sort of deposit, but when you combine it with a Cascadia earthquake underneath, it becomes a big thick deposit. And so what what this tells us is that we can use the stratigraphy and the layering of these these units to tell us quite a bit about these past earthquakes beyond just that they happened, you know. And so the the 1700 earthquake is is a great example. And in that in that case we have just like that just that image we just saw, we have the 1700 earthquake at the bottom of the stack and on top of it is a 1700 San Andreas earthquake, uh, which is uh, which came shortly, shortly thereafter, and there's a there's a a, a, a kind of power to this that gives you uh, more precision than you could get from radiocarbon ages, for example. So on the Cascadia side, we know the date and even time of day of that earthquake, but on the San Andreas side, the radiocarbon age age doesn't give it give us the age of that event to better than 150 years, uh, but we can see that it's so closely stacked on top of Cascadia that no time passed between them. So normally the inner event into uh, sediment just rains like snow at a certain rate, about 20 centimeters per thousand years. And so if you see um, 20 centimeters, you know a thousand years has gone by and so on. And, and there's really nothing between them. And on the Cascadia side, it looks like the San Andre or the Cascadia bed is, was, was deposited, and then the San Andreas bed came down. It looks like while the San, the Cascadia bed was still settling, so so they were so close in time uh, that the bottom one was still settling out, and that brings it down to hours, to maybe a day or two at the very very most, but more likely hours. And then the the, the final piece for for that event in particular was. Um, some investigators were working on tree ring evidence of damage during earthquakes along the northern San Andreas, and they were looking to push the record back beyond 1906 and catch the last one before that. And they did, I think, or they think they did, and I agree, uh, that the last event was either the in the year 1698 or 1700, and 1700 matches all the other, matches our data quite well. And so we have corroboration of this model from for that event um, from separate researchers, separate methods, completely independent, which is great. That's what we always hope for in science, that somebody will come along and say, hey, look, I found the same thing. Um, so that makes that event pretty special. Well, remarkable. Yeah, all of that lining up 
those two different situations. So with this data set now that you have and you know the correlation between all of these different events, what does this mean going forward for studying and understanding both of these fault lines and this potential interaction between the two? Well, um, so typically we think about in geology that the, the concept of one fault triggering another fault by transferring stress. You know, when a, when a fault ruptures, it relieves stress at that location. But since plate tectonics keeps going, um, it, it tends to transfer stress to, to places nearby, right? So uh, if that happens, and that's what we think happened in this case, we're used to thinking about that happening on a one-off basis. This earthquake triggered this earthquake, and that happened in Sumatra, say, in 2004. It clearly triggered the 2005 earthquake three months later. But usually that's the end of the story. You know, we, we don't often have records long enough to go back further in time and see what happens over a long period. And so in this case, we do. We have good long records on both fault systems. And it looks like these faults are have been intertwined or partially synchronized uh, for thousands of years, not just for the 1700 event, but the one before that and before that and before that. And so this is a hypothesis that's been out there for uh, since 2010, so, you know, a, a little while now. Uh, a rock mechanics guru named Chris Schultz, who wrote the textbook on this topic, um, suggested this could happen, that faults could synchronize um, over long periods of time. And so our, but he didn't have good field um, examples of this hypothesis. And so we're proposing that San Andreas and Cascadia might be a, a good field example of this idea have actually linked up. Do you think there's a potential that either one of them could be linked up to other fault lines, you know, on either side of them? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, once you find the leg bone is connected to the knee bone, you might find right. other connections as well. I, I, I really have no idea, and there's not any evidence that I know of that, that um, points directly in that, in that uh direction but um it's certainly a good place to look now that we now that we think we know that there is this connection wow really interesting just to just to think about that and know you know all of this data that you found well chris anything else that you think is important just for people to know about the study that you've had here and and what this information means making these connections well yeah greg i think that um for people in the pacific northwest uh we've we've been We've gotten used to hearing about the big one for a long time, and we're 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 sort of low on the on the preparedness curve. There, we have a lot of unreinforced mason masonry buildings. We just had the shakeout today, which kind of uh, puts an exclamation point on uh, getting prepared and getting our region resilient to this this earthquake. It's not just a theoretical thing; it's real. Um, but this study doesn't really uh, do anything, it doesn't change anything for the Pacific Northwest. Um, it, 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 it strengthens some of the evidence for it, but it doesn't, the implications are, are limited for the Northwest. But, uh, you know, if this is accurate, accurate and, and two events come to pass within a short span of time, it does have implications for everyone because uh, drawing down the resources of the whole country to respond to one of these things alone uh, could could be doubled if we're, if the country is trying to respond to two of them at the same time, so it has that implication. Um, one other is if you're in the in the San Francisco Bay Area or anywhere in Northern California, uh, toward the coast, the Cascadia subduction zone could potentially serve as a as a warning system for Northern California. Right now, we have a, a an automated warning system that gives you seconds of response time if the earthquake starts. But what if we had a warning system that gave you minutes to hours to days uh, of, of warning? And it, it could be that the Santa, or that Cascadia would be that warning bell for Northern California. And we just we just stuck to you know the geology in the paper and didn't didn't address any of these things. Uh, but that's a that's a possibility that hasn't really been considered um, uh, by anyone that I know of. So something to think about is what, what can we do with this information as far as a society? Yeah, there's a lot to factor in there. And as you mentioned, you know, it, the idea or the possibility of, of the country responding to two major disasters like that or two major earthquakes um, and everything that comes along with that. I mean, that's, that's pretty wild to think about. But I mean, thanks to the study, as you mentioned, people should be thinking about these things and with the shakeout today too, you know, preparing for earthquakes, it's important to realize that, yeah, it's real. Yeah, they, these are, these earthquakes are real. They are going to happen at some point, whether it's tomorrow or 
200 years from now, you know, that it is going to happen. Um, so being prepared is so important. Well, Chris, thank you so much, you know, for joining us too, just to have this conversation about this and uh, share this information and all this work that you all have put in to bring to everybody. Really, really appreciate it. And for anybody who wants to follow up with any of your research or more information on this, is there anywhere we can direct them to go? Uh, well, I have a WordPress uh, blog called AT Quake, and it gives a little more, a uh, little more accessible version of this story than than say the the full scientific paper, which is pretty dense. Um, so that might be a place to start. Um, I'll be writing more on that on that blog, of, of, you know, about this topic in in coming days and weeks. So I try to I try to put uh, you know more accessible versions of, of some of this uh, type of research there uh, for people who are interested. Okay, great. So people can go there and take a look at more of that. And Chris, thank you so much for joining us here on Fox 12 Now. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks very much for having me on. Absolutely. And for everybody watching, too, this is Fox 12 Now. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom. So we appreciate everybody who's joining us, wherever that may be. We cover a wide range of topics and we get to have these longer form conversations. So feel free to download the Fox 12 Oregon app and go through there and uh, take a look at all the different things that we cover. But thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. You can send me an email, fox12 now at kptv.com. You can see right there. So if you have an idea for a subject, feel free to do so. Uh, but that's it for right now. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.